I would like to start with section number two. And uh, this section will be uh, shared by Professor Asimina Atanapouliou from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, and by myself, and Asimouliou from Institut Superior Technique in Portugal. I would like to ask Professor Asimina to introduce the first speaker of this section. Thank you. This session, uh, in this session, uh, three papers will be presented. Uh, the title of the first one is uh, Multidirectional Ladder Rolls and Combination Rules in Pushover Analysis. Uh, the paper will be presented by Cristina Catangalo, uh, University of uh, Anuccio. Good morning. I'm Cristina Cantagallo from the University of Chieti Pescara uh, in Italy. And um, so in this presentation, I will describe the work performed to analyze the multidirectional lateral loads and the combination rules in pushover analysis. Um, then for, so, um, Excuse me. Um, in order um, to consider multidirectional excitation effects in linear field, most current seismic code required the use of um, SRSS rule and uh, alternatively the application of the 30% rule, according to, for example, the Eurocode 8. And the different regulatory codes prescri prescribe their application also for nonlinear static pushover analysis. So the main. objective of this work of the validity of the direct um, the pushover uh, to this purpose the pushover analysis of three regular rainforest concrete structures are performed and the corresponding capacity curves are obtained in their um, in um, the main structural direction and then for uh, each consider um, orthogonal direction the um, circular demand are calculated using the n2 method according to Pfeiffer. Uh, the obtained results are then uh, combined uh, using the combination rules, and, uh, but the other pushover analysis are performed rotating the pushover seismic forces with uh, incident angles uh, theta for each uh, for uh, theta um, equal to uh, 20, 22.5 degrees, and the corresponding structural demand with the N2 method are calculated. Uh, then finally, the structural demand obtained from the different nonlinear static analysis are compared with those computed by nonlinear time history analysis performed using, uh, using suite of real and generated ground motion records. So in order to compute the structural response that take into account for the multidirection uh, for the multidirectionality of the seismic load, various researchers proposed to combine the structural demands obtained by uh, obtained by applying the response spectrum analysis simultaneously in the two uh, principal structural direction. Um, Newman Terrasenblot in 1971 state the SRSS rule. And uh, this rule uh, is um, the first application uh, of this rule is due to Goodman uh, for the for combining the vibration modes. So subsequently, the Kuregain and Wilson formulated the CQC rule for closely spaced mode. And uh, further consideration about the application of the, of the multi-component earthquake excitation. Um, in linear analysis were performed by Newmark in 1975 and uh, Rosenbluth and Contreras in, 19, in 1977. They proposed the percentage rule, of, uh, rule which uh, approximates the multi-component response as the sum of the 100% of the response resulting from one component and a percentage of the responses resulting from the other component. More specifically, Newmark um, suggested uh, 
the 40% rule, and the Rosenblatt and Contreras suggested the 30% rule. Subsequently, other author. Mm, Subsequently, other authors, and, and in particular, um, other author, uh, and in particular Menun and Der Cure again, um, suggested the CQC3 directional combination rule that, um, that uh, this combination rule determines the generic response quantity in function of the seismic orientation angle. Uh, the CQC3 uh, is able to identify the most critical orientation of the ground motion components for each response quantity of interest in, in the linear range. Um, Kamata, uh, uh, the CQC3 can be considered uh, the, um, the most general case of, the, of all combination rules. So uh, Kamata in um, 2007 performed a um, comparison uh, between directional combination rules in linear range um, and uh, re revealing that uh, the SRSS rule provides values always greater than the um, critical response. And um, the, according to this work, the 30% rule can underestimate the response the response obtained uh, by applying the SRSSS rule. Despite these two rules were, for, uh, were uh, originally formulated for uh, linear structural responses, uh, the current regulatory codes prescribe their application also for nonlinear static analysis. In particular, the Eurocode 8 states that uh, when uh, a special, mold, uh, a special models, uh, model is applied, uh, the SRSS or the 30% um, combination rule should be applied. In particular, it should be applied uh, combining the, uh, uh, the action effects due to the application of the seismic actions, according to this code. Uh, so, um, in order to um, evaluate uh, the application of the response uh, of the combination rule in, uh, in uh, the pushover analysis, the, the pushover analysis of three regular reinforced concrete structure are performed, uh, more specifically two uh, one floor test bed structure, and uh, 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 both uh, uh, are um, irregular, plan irregular, and uh, one structure, uh, one uh, more complex and real structure having um, uh, five floor. Um, the selective structures so have uh, an increase in plan irregularity and complexity. The nonlinear analysis are carried out um, with the computer software OpenSeas with uh, a force-based fiber section frame model um, using uh, for uh, both beams and columns. Nonlinear no linear static analysis are performed considering, considering two uh, lateral load patterns, uh, two invariant uh, lateral load patterns, a mass proportional distribution, and a load pattern proportional to the story forces uh, calculated in, the, in a linear dynamic analysis. And uh, for each considering, um, for each considered um, structure and uh, load pattern for nonlinear static um, analysis are performed in the main structural direction, obtaining for, uh, for each direction the corresponding, uh, um, the corresponding pushover course. Then um, the pushover, uh, the structural demand are calculated according to the N2 method and the Eurocode A, and uh, they are combined, uh, combined uh, according to the SRSS and the 30% uh, combination rule. Moreover, other pushover curves uh, are obtained rotating the pushover seismic forces with the uh, incident angles theta. And then corresponding structural demand are calculated uh, parallel to the seismic forces. Finally, the structural demands obtained for, uh, from the different nonlinear static analysis are compared with uh, those computed uh, by nonlinear time history analysis using both the real and generated ground motion record. So um, the, the results of uh, structure one 
uh, the displacement demands of uh, of the structure one on side A and uh, on the side A and side B reveal uh, that the maximum pushover displacement in the um, strong direction, in the X direction, are conservative with respect uh, to the results of nonlinear time history analysis. And um, uh, the, in the epsilon direction, in the weak direction, all nonlinear analysis uh, generate similar displacement. For um, structure two, the displacement demands reveal the, that all displacement uh, obtain, or demands uh, obtained for nonlinear static analysis uh, in the strong structural uh, direction, in the X direction, are conservative with respect to the corresponding results of nonlinear time history analysis. And um, conversely, the pushover displacement on the epsilon direction are um, lower than uh, nonlinear time history analysis. obtain uh, with natural records, uh, but uh, the results provide uh, those of the analysis. The displacement demand uh, obtained uh, um, on the top floor of uh, structure three reveal that uh, the nonlinear time history analysis uh, on the graph on the left um, provide unconservative displacement uh, in the X direction except uh, for the multidirectional nonlinear static analysis with pro, um, with, uh, which produce conservative result on side, uh, on side A. In the epsilon direction, um, the N2 results are conservative with respect uh, to the nonlinear time history analysis uh, only on side A, probably to, due to the strong torsion of the deck. Uh, by contrast, multidirectional multi um, nonlinear static analysis uh, are uh, always uh, conservative uh, in this case uh, and very close to nonlinear time history analysis. Um, so this graph, uh, uh, both these graphs refer to the mass proportional growth pattern. Um, in this work uh, are um, evaluated also the shear demands, uh, calculating the ratios between the shear demands obtained from nonlinear static analysis and uh, the nonlinear time history analysis in the main structural direction and uh, on the main structural direction. Uh, the, and uh, on the directional theta. In particular, um, the maximum shear values uh, are obtained for in the main structural direction are first evaluated, then uh, are applied, uh, the, um, uh, the, the shear demands are calculated using the combination rules, and finally, finally the application of the pushover forces at different incident angles um, uh, uh, allowed the, the calculation of the maximum shear values obtained at each theta uh, of each uh, theta. In conclusion, we can say that the combination rules applied on displacement demand on, of uh, single story buildings don't provide results very different from the conventional uh, ANCHO method. Um, then the displacement demand, uh, but the displacement demand obtained from multi-directional nonlinear static analysis is very performing for uh, multi-story buildings, uh, where the method also provides accurate prediction of flow rotation. Um, the push, all pushover procedures uh, provide uh, an overestimation of shear demand in single-story structures in uh, both direction and for all columns. Um, conversely, for multi study structures, the um, shear demands in nonlinear static analysis are greater than the resu results of nonlinear time history analysis only if uh, combination rules are, are applied. So uh, we, have, um, we can say that uh, the pushover procedures in general depend on uh, structural con configuration and, degree, and the degree of plan irregularity. Therefore, uh, future researchers should uh, further investigate the, the effects of different pushover procedures on uh, further load patterns, ADPs, and structural EDPs, engineering demand parameters, and structural configurations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Is there any question I can see? 
Yes, uh, Professor Eduardo Marino is raising his hand, so I'm going to ask him. Okay. Okay, may I talk? Okay. Thank you. Yes, you can, Professor Marino. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation. I want to know just uh, a detail. Maybe you told, but uh, I did not under understand. What kind of uh, modeling have you adopted for uh, members? I mean, if you have considered the biaxial uh, interaction of bending moment in the two plane for uh, columns or not? Yes, yes, um, it is a um, fiber section model okay. for both the beams and columns. So uh, we have considered the interaction. Okay, okay. Thank you, because I think it is, this is a very important thing to be considered in the kind of study that you are conducting. Thank you for the question. May I do a question, please? Okay. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. It goes very clearly. Uh, so I want to mention something uh, that um, uh, the patent combination rule by Rosenbus and uh, Newmarket is uh, valid when the two components of excitation are uncorrelated and each component excites different uh, model, modes. So uh, we can see that uh, the first building. Uh, can you show the slide, please, for the stay, uh, for the first building, uh, the perfect, uh, the mass participation ratio? You have a slide with the mass participation ratio of each building. So we can open the previous one. Okay. The next one, the next one. The previous you had the, the next one. Yes. In um... the next one, the next slide, please. For the mass participation yes. ratios, there is a, a table with the mass participation ratios. This one? No, no, the next slide. No. This, the previous. Okay. The previous. The, the previous. previous one. The previous, yeah. yes, this one. Ah, in okay, this okay. Slide, in this okay. slide, uh, we can see uh, MZ is suppose uh, that is uh, the mass participation ratio for torsional uh, excitation. Yes, the, the mass participation, mm -hmm. participation uh, ratios are shown uh, in. Uh, the and low part MZ of the is the mass participation ratio for torsional excitation. So we can see that for structure one, uh, the mass so participation for the, for the first mode is too, too high, 98%. And uh, for the third mode is 90%. And this is for excitation X and excitation Y. So the uh, percentage combination rules are valid according to Rosenbusch and the Newmark. The same is valid for the second structure where the excitation along Y excites the first mode by 99%, uh, almost 100%. And the third uh, and uh, the excitation along X excites the third mode. So the rules for percentage combination rules are valid. However, in the third structure is uh, is 
v1 or when we can see if the uh, percentage combination rules can be applied. Because the first and the second structure um, satisfy the assumption in which uh, the percentage combination rule is based. So, can we yes. see again the results for the third building? The third building, uh, the, the combination of the rules are applied uh, also in the, in, uh, in the third uh, building in nonlinear analysis according to the code. Okay, I know well that the codes ignore the assumptions behind the percentage combination. Yeah, yeah, I know the, the, the work of the Rosenluth and Contreras. So, uh, in, it is true, but uh, uh, we have to consider the current regulatory code and uh, describe the effect, the, the, the effect positive and also negative of the, this application. I, I, I think, I, do, I don't know. Uh, so I want to mention that uh, the first, the second building, uh, um, will satisfy these uh, rules even if the structure inserted into the inelastic range. And the third building uh, where uh, uh, the excitation along x-axis excites uh, a mode uh, where the, the translation uh, the along T dominates uh, as well as along uh, uh, C, so is uh, uh, the more appropriate uh, for your uh, uh, investigation. Yeah, uh, we are um, um, only, uh, only a quick, uh, only a consideration. Uh, we, um, we have considered uh, not only three modes, but the 85% um, of the, uh, of the particip participation masses, uh, not only three modes, but uh, uh, more modes in the analysis. And for the third structure, because the first one... Uh... The, uh, for the first two structure, of sure, uh, uh, no. For the third structure, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, we have considered uh, many modes. Uh, yes, but uh, we can uh, see that uh, the um, uh, sum of uh, the three modes is uh, enough uh, for uh, the study. They said, uh, uh, 85% along the direction and uh, 75% along the uh, Y direction. Okay, congratulations. Uh, however, I think uh, that uh, uh, the next uh, uh, investigate, under investigation buildings uh, uh, would not comply with uh, the uh, rule of, or on the assumption posed by uh, Newmark and uh, Rosenbolt. So in these buildings, we can uh, uh, criticize uh, this uh, rule. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations okay. again. Okay. Very Thank good. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, apparently, Professor uh, Kenji Fuji was asking to raise his hand. I would like to ask him if he can uh, share his questions through the chat and uh, address them to the, to the authors of this. Uh, paper um, and to the speaker. So we are going to move uh, to the second presentation of this section because we are short in time. Uh, I apologize for this. Thank you. Uh, Katal, um, 
So the second speaker is um, uh, Thomas Paulbosti, and the title of the presentation is Effects of Column Based Flexibility on Seismic Response of Instrumental Steel Moment Frame Building. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomasz Forborski, and I am very pleased uh, to give a short presentation on effects of column-based flexibility on seismic response of instrumented steel moment frame buildings. And uh, as you can see on our team, there's also uh, Ahmad Hassan and Professor Amit Kanvinde from, uh, from UC Davis. Actually, Professor Amit Kanvinde uh, is also the, uh, the principal investigator uh, in this project. Uh, before I start, uh, let me just uh, acknowledge uh, the support that we got from California Department of Conservation, uh, California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program, CSMIP, and Pacific Earthquake uh, Engineering Research Center. Also, we are very grateful and I would like to thank Professor Farzin Zarian at UC Irvine and Professor Pablo Torres uh, at Universitat San Francisco de Quito um, in Ecuador. Okay, so we all know that, uh, that steel moment resisting frames, which, uh, which you can see in these two pictures, are very popular uh, lateral load resisting systems and they are widely used in many seismically active regions around the world. Uh, steel moment resisting frames uh, consist of beams and columns uh, with moment resisting connections. Uh, steel moment resisting frames resist large uh, lateral forces by flexure and shear in beams and columns. Uh, more specifically, uh, ductility can be achieved either by uh, flexural yielding of columns or shear yielding of column pollen zones or flexural yielding of beams, uh, as you can see uh, in these three, uh, three graphics. Uh, steel moment resisting flame, uh, frames have uh, have a lot of uh, have a lot of advantages, among which uh, these two are counted among the most important ones: uh, architectural uh, versatility, which is mainly due to the unbraced frames, and also high ductility and safety. One drawback of steel moment resisting frames is their uh, is their low elastic stiffness. Uh, on the right, uh, on the right side, you can see the uh, uh, the steel moment frame buildings uh, during uh, during its uh, erection. Recent uh, recent research uh, revealed that uh, that column based flexibility, uh, which column uh, column based connections, uh, which in current uh, engineering practice uh, are usually modeled as either pinned or fixed may have a relatively large impact on the, uh, on the seismic response of steel moment frame buildings. Uh, right here, you can see the uh, three most popular types of column-based connections. Starting from the left, we can see the exposed column-based connections with anchor rods. Uh, then there's a slab overtapped uh, base connection and finally the, the embedded one. Now, the aim of, the, uh, of our study is to introduce best practices for simulation of column-based fixity in steel moment resisting frames using recorded time history data from uh, two building instrumented as part of the CSMIP. Now, uh, to achieve this goal, uh, we started from constructing detailed uh, numerical models of two instrumented buildings. One was with the exposed and the other one uh, was with uh, embedded column bases. Uh, in the next step, we evaluated the rotational stiffness of column bases uh, we refer to, uh, that we refer to as K model, based on the detailed uh, structural drawings and available analytical models. And finally, we compared uh, recorded time history uh, data with numerical simulation results for different values of column base flexibilities. Uh, we analyzed pin connection, fixed base uh, connection, uh, K model, and some uh, intermediate value, 0.5K model and 1.5K model. 
the first building that we analyzed, uh, oh, we performed the analysis uh, in, in ETAP software. So uh, the first building is actually the, uh, the three-story uh, office building located in Richmond in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in California. This building has exposed base plates. Uh, it was instrumented <clears throat> with 12 uh, sensors and there's uh, eight ground motions available for this ground motion records. Uh, available for uh, for this one. Right here, you can see uh, our model and the Google Earth uh, photograph of the building. And the second building is the uh, is the sixth uh, six story commercial building uh, located in Burbank in the Los Angeles basin. Uh, this building has embedded column bases. Mm, it was uh, it was instrumented with uh, 13 sensors uh, and there's seven ground motions available uh, for this one. For both of them, you can see the uh, CSMIP station number. After creating the, uh, the detailed uh, ETAPS model, we evaluated the uh, rotational stiffness <coughs> of column bases. To do that, uh, we used two procedures. Uh, for the Richmond building, building number one with the exposed column basis, we used the procedure uh, proposed by, <clears throat> by Convinde, Grilli, and Zarian in 2012. And for the, uh, for the building number two, which is the Burbank building with embedded column basis, we adopted the methodology proposed by Torres, uh, Zarian, and Convinde in 2017. Uh, with, uh, and as you can see on the right side, we use base springs uh, with linear rotational stiffness uh, in two directions <clears throat> to introduce the, uh, the rotational uh, flexibility of column bases. Now, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, can I go back like two slides? Or can I do it myself? Yes, you can do it yourself. If not, we can help you. Okay, I'm moving forward. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, last, uh, the last step before running the, uh, the analysis, uh, um, actually we need to came, come up with, uh, with a methodology of how to introduce the non-structural stiffness uh, to the model. Uh, can I use the annotate tool here? Can I draw on this slide? Yes, of course. So uh, let's imagine that we have a n-story uh, instrumented building. <clears throat> and now uh, for every story, we have the, uh, the acceleration, the velocity, and the displacement time histories. Now, uh, with these values, we can very easily uh, calculate the interstory quantities. So we can have the interstory uh, the interstory drift and the inter and the interstory velocity. Now, if we analyze uh, only those time instants where the interstory velocity is equal to zero, uh, then with that assumption, uh, the damping uh, the damping part in the uh, in the dynamic equation of motion is also equal to zero. Uh, with 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 that, we can calculate the shear forces. Uh, in the non-structural elements using this, uh, this formula. And the, uh, and the shear forces in the structural elements, we can easily calculate from ETAPS analysis uh, using the, uh, the displacements at those times instants. Eventually, if we plot the uh, shear force in the non-structural elements versus the interstory drift, uh, we can get a nice line uh, that represents the, uh, the non-structural stiffness, which we introduced to the model by putting additional braces. Okay, let me clear this. Right, sorry, right here you can see some uh, uh, sample re re results. These are the, uh, the acceleration time history for the building number one, which is the, uh, the Richmond building under the Loma Prieta earthquake. The top row uh, represents the north-south direction and the bottom row represents the east-west direction. Now, uh, the first column, uh, in the first column, there's a comparison between the recording and the simulation 
uh, with the fixed base assumption. And in the second column, we can see the comparison between the recording and the simulation where we use the, and the estimated rotational stiffness uh, of the column base. And as you can see, the error that we, uh, that we used in the study is actually, uh, let me draw it. The error is actually the U double dot and the acceleration that was uh, recorded minus U double dot uh, computed by U double dot recorded. So uh, you can see that using actually the, uh, the real rotational flexibility uh, results in decrease of error from 10 to even, uh, to even 15%. Uh, we performed uh, 75 uh, analysis, and here you can see the, uh, the mean error values. Uh, epsilon total uh, represents the total error. Epsilon 10% represents the error, uh, which was calculated only for the, uh, for the strong motion portion of each, um, of each record, meaning that we, we used this formula only for those time instances where the uh, when, where the acceleration uh, exceeded 10% of the maximum uh, acceleration. Now, close inspection of these two figures uh, suggests that it may be reasonable uh, to use the real rotational stiffness uh, for buildings with exposed column bases, which you can see on the, uh, in the left figure. <laughs> Okay, so uh, concluding re re remarks, number one, uh, simulating column bases as, uh, the first one is pretty obvious. Uh, simulating column bases as spent, even when they are constructed as exposed base plates results in gross mischaracter mischaracterization of, uh, of frame response. Uh, number two, for exposed base plate connections, simulating the bases using model base estimates is advisable uh, since it results in the best agreement between the recorded and simulated time histories for both acceleration and displacement records. Number three, uh, for embedded base connections, <coughs> simulating the bases as fixed or with the model base estimates results in the lowest error. This suggests that from a standpoint of elastic building response, it is reasonable to simulate the basis as fixed, given the higher effort and expertise required for model-based estimation. And finally, <clears throat> since the response appears to be relatively insensitive to the flexibility in close uh, neighborhood of the model-based estimates, explicit consideration of soil or footing flexibility may not be uh, critical. One thing that I uh, forgot to mention, the soil type was a type B uh, that, uh, that we used in this study. Let me clear my drawings and uh, yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that we have no time for questions. All right, we to you, uh, but I will ask uh, if anyone has a question, to share it on the chat or directly and share it with the speaker. And I would like to move for the third and final presentation of this section. Um, so it will be presented by Beatrice Belletti. And the title of the presentation is Seismic Risk Assessment of Existing RC Frame Shear Wall Buildings. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, Thank you very much. And um, my presentation today is about uh, irregularity of uh, reinforced concrete core structural uh, systems. Uh, typically, um, it is, uh, as you can see on the, on the right, uh, in Italy, uh, we can have a quite uh, common uh, situation of uh, reinforced concrete uh, frames with uh, uh, reinforced concrete walls and uh, cores, uh, which are designed only according uh, to uh, pre-seismic pre, pre code, so only for uh, gravity loads. And uh, 
core structural systems represent a quite common construction solution, especially in large urban areas with a higher population density. Reinforced concrete walls are usually placed around the staircases or elevator shafts. And of course, if wisely designed, reinforced concrete walls may have a positive effect on the seismic performance of the frame structure and may help preventing a soft story collapse mechanism. Nevertheless, in existing buildings, the position of reinforced concrete walls is often asymmetric in plan, representing a source of structural irregularity and creating a torsional effects under seismic action. Um, so this study is devoted to the definition of uh, the engineering de demand parameter and their damage threshold uh, limits for uh, the construction of uh, fragility curves. The case study is uh, selected between uh, um, an ex uh, is an example of uh, which is uh, presented in uh, two uh, textbooks. Uh, uh, frequently used in Italy for uh, didactic uh, purposes, and therefore you can uh, appreciate uh, the um, asymmetric position of uh, the core. And we selected uh, this example because we don't have, uh, um, from, uh, for example, uh, CARTIS database or uh, other database. Uh, coming uh, after the survey, uh, after uh, earthquakes, uh, we don't have um, a common uh, example that could be used. So we selected this example coming from uh, textbooks, which is representative of a multi-story uh, building uh, in a zone of the North Italy, in the North Italy zone, closer to Milan, we can say. And um, the reinforcement of the 200 uh, thick, uh, millimeter thick walls uh, forming uh, the core is uh, dimensioned with uh, reference to induction and to a conventional horizontal load equal to 0.5% of the weight. And uh, both uh, interstory floors and the floors uh, are realized with a parallel reinforced concrete joist and interposed hollow clay blocks with a topping slab four centimeter thick. And we, in this study, we assumed that this is a condition for a rigid diaphragm. Uh, and also you can check the, um, the class of concrete and the adopted property for, uh, for the steel. About, um, the modeling he, in this uh, slide, you can see the eccentric position uh, that uh, the eccentric position of the core is uh, the main, the major cause of in plane uh, irregularity, uh, shifting uh, the center of mass away from the center of stiffness. And uh, the modeling is uh, subdivided into step, steps, uh, in, the, in three steps, I can say. In the first step, uh, since uh, the structure of the building is conceived uh, as a wall equivalent uh, dual system, beams and columns are considered as uh, elements of a pendulum frame and their interaction uh, with uh, the core under seismic action is neglected and the major part of this presentation is about uh, this modeling. But I will tell you at the end what we are doing uh, now in the further step of the, this research where we are also modeling the nonlinear behavior of the frame and uh, of the infill uh, masonry um, wall. Here you can see a general view of the adopted 3D finite element model and uh, with some uh, okay, indication about the modeling of uh, the wall realized by adopting shell elements and the columns okay and um, the behavior of the the nonlinear behavior of the wall has been evaluated by a crack model which has been implemented at the university of parma as a user subroutine for abacus um, code 
And uh, the crack model is a fixed crack model based on a, a smeared assumption for reinforcement in the hosting concrete uh, element. And uh, we, mo we modeled uh, the nonlinear behavior of the main phenomena occurring um, after cracking, um, uh, such as uh, the aggregate interlock effect, tension stiffening, and also the constitutive uh, model for concrete and steel. And recently, here you can see the cyclic law for steel uh, by assuming a Menegotto and Pinto formulation, but recently we implemented also Kashani model able to take into account for the buckling uh, of uh, rebar in compression. And also now we implemented also the effect of uh, corrosion of uh, uh, reinforcement. So uh, with uh, this model, we can perform a uh, Static and also dynamic nonlinear analysis. In this uh, presentation, I will uh, show you only the result obtained uh, by adopting a pushover analysis. And uh, pushover analysis have been uh, carried out by applying the usual distribution of lateral forces. We applied this distribution uh, in an uncoupled way along the two different directions. So we hope in the future to take a benefit of the research uh, done, for example, during uh, the previous uh, presentation uh, by Cristina Cantagallo and other colleagues uh, to implement also this option to take into account for the contemporary uh, action along uh, the two uh, direction. And um, here you can see a view of uh, the resulting uh, pushover curves, uh, which are, as I told you, only depending at this stage on the nonlinear uh, response of the wall, because at this stage, uh, the frame is modeled, modeled as a pendular, uh, uh, as a pendular uh, element. And, um, about uh, the choice uh, of uh, the engineering uh, uh, demand uh, parameter, uh, I have uh, to indicate that uh, the threshold uh, limits value are, uh, for the generation of the fragility curves have been obtained uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, the capacity spectrum method by uh, uh, considering uh, the uh, um, acceleration displacement response spectrum method and by uh, the identification of the target uh, displacement corresponding to the achievement of uh, the different uh, uh, damage threshold limit. And uh, for these uh, purposes, we analyze the different uh, metrics uh, for the evaluation of these uh, damage uh, threshold uh, limits and also the definition of uh, the damage the damage and what uh, we applied essentially uh, is uh, the metric adopted by asus and uh, risk way which are mainly based on the interstory drift but what we tried to do since we have uh, these uh, b-dimensional elements like uh, walls we tried to um uh, interpret uh, the FEMA prescription uh, by applying a measure to um, strain a value in concrete and in steel, depending on the different structural performance uh, levels. Uh, so here you can see uh, the, the, the definition of the damage levels corresponding to ASUS and the risk uh, UA uh, metrics based on interstory drift. But what we did in reality is to apply this concept, as I told you, inspired by FEMA approach. Uh, so uh, it, defining in the pushover curves, the points of the curves where this um, material strain in concrete and in steel are, uh, are reached. And uh, here you can see an example of this application where you can uh, uh, see the pushover curve 
the different uh, top displacement corresponding to the achievement of the damage level by risk and uh, ASUS uh, approach. And uh, uh, these points are corresponding to the achievement of uh, strain uh, limit value if concrete, in concrete and in uh, steel as uh, we uh, defined uh, from uh, the previous uh, slide. Essentially, we have the first uh, damage levels corresponding to the cracking uh, in, um, in, um, in beams and uh, in uh, other parts of uh, the walls, of the core walls. And um, uh, later we have the yielding of uh, the longitudinal uh, rebars and uh, the reaching of this uh, value equal to 1% uh, of strain in a longitudinal rebars. This is the achievement of the yielding in, in horizontal uh, reinforcement the achievement of uh, the limit value for concrete for damage to uh, as, as we defined uh, the, the cover spalling we can say and again um, we achieved the, the final value of these pushover curves when we obtain the, the crushing of, uh, of concrete. And uh, we tried to generate on the base of this damage limits uh, value uh, the fragility curves by adopting uh, um, a software uh, which was implemented by Professor Martinelli. And um, so uh, we used this, uh, um, this uh, software inputting uh, the pushover analysis and uh, uh, the response spectrum accelerograms uh, that uh, we would like uh, to adopt. And finally, we obtained uh, these uh, fragility curves uh, that of course are quite uh, strange because as you can appreciate, uh, the fragility curves associated to uh, damage level three and four are quite uh, far from uh, the fragility curves uh, associated to, to damage uh, state uh, two. The reason of that, of course, is due that we neglected the effect of uh, the, the frame. So uh, the, the second step of our uh, research is, was the implementation of the nonlinear behavior also of uh, the frame, because what we would like to appreciate is that even for a small value of uh, uh, top displacement due to this irregularity, we can have uh, high value of uh, uh, cord rotation in uh, columns, which could uh, cause the columns failure. And indeed, in uh, this uh, pushover curve, uh, we can appreciate that um, the uh, collapse uh, limit state related to the achievement of the cord rotation of columns uh, is occurring before uh, uh, the collapse of, uh, the, of the wall, uh, meaning that uh, this nonlinearity, this, uh, this failure mode is uh, leading uh, the definition of uh, the um, fragility curve for a higher uh, damage uh, state. And uh, what we are now also do, doing uh, since uh, at this moment uh, the uh, uh, collapse uh, limit state uh, are um, depending on, uh, uh, call on frame behavior, but uh, the um, level damage state one and two, damage grade state one and two is related to crack to cracking of uh, uh, the wall. Now we are uh, implementing also the effect of uh, in a field of masonry frame uh, to check uh, if uh, at the earlier stages uh, this uh, masonry uh, in field uh, wall walls can uh, prevent a bit uh, this irregularity and uh, can modify also the, 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 the first uh, limit state uh, um, and uh, damage uh, value. 
So this is essentially what uh, we are doing. And uh, as a general conclusion, I would like to indicate that uh, the data on the amount of building uh, designed for gravity loads uh, only and uh, characterized by irregularity induced by the presence of reinforced concrete walls uh, are uh, scarce uh, and based, based only on surveys data collected after earthquake. And therefore, in the future, I would like uh, to start also an initiative uh, trying uh, to collect uh, data uh, on uh, structural typologies uh, uh, in order to be able to appreciate uh, which is the actual percentage of buildings that could be characterized by this irregularity, which is, which is not uh, typically considered in the generation also of risk maps, uh, uh, which are more uh, um, associated to uh, frames and, we, and which are a bit neglecting uh, these uh, aspects. So this is uh, all, uh, that's all. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I think we have, um, Professor Asimina, you have raised your hand. You want to say something? Or... Oh, yes, but uh, first, uh, let's give uh, the speak to Amir Marjoko, okay. okay, and Eduardo Martin, and then, and last one. Yeah, uh, so thank you for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, analytical model. Um, can you explain how you modeled the connection with the foundations or uh, have you considered soil structure interaction? No, not at this stage, not at this stage. Okay, uh, how, how you ex expect that the results will change with this uh, of course, it depends also on the kind of on the type of foundation. Uh, to be honest, I don't. I I have uh, to check if it was a plate or it was a beam uh, foundation. I guess a beam uh, foundation. So of course, it could have uh, an effect uh, also above all uh, regarding the nonlinear behavior of the frame. But it is uh, we are increasing and increasing the level of refinement. But we would like to be aware of. Uh, step by step what we are adding uh, to the difficulties. Otherwise, uh, if we start implementing, uh, starting from the beginning, everything, uh, we are not able to recognize uh, the different effects. So of course, uh, your um, advice uh, is important, is uh, of course an important aspect uh, to be considered, but uh, we are trying before to solve other issues. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to ask Professor Eduardo Marino if he would like to make a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the interesting uh, presentation. And uh, my question is uh, about uh, uh, the future studies that you are planning because you want to deepen this study. And uh, we have seen that uh, uh, <clears throat> the problem that you have found in your structure is not on the on the core but in the rc frame and structure yes it is and uh, this is because uh, the eccentricity between uh, stiffness center and mass center and so i am uh, i am thinking uh, what uh, in the case uh, there is not the rc core what do you what do you expect for uh, the performance of the of the structure that uh, it will be better or it will be worse. And we are planning I mean, uh, uh, to study be, on this. It will be more flexible, meaning that the, uh, the typical assumed value for frames uh, uh, may be different in case of the presence of the wall. I mean, uh, I mean what I mean is that uh, if we consider the the metrics adopted, the damage limit threshold adopted for frames uh, without uh, this uh, eccentricity induced by reinforced concrete walls. Uh, of course, considering the multi-story frame is more flexible. So 
uh, these uh, th threshold limits uh, are uh, reached for uh, uh, higher uh, displays, top displacement. But uh, the presence of the wall could, in could induce, uh, in due to the torsion of the diaphragm, in a correspondence of lower interstory drift and also lower top displacement, uh, higher damage in columns than what could be expected by adopting the typical uh, uh, limit value adopted for frame. Okay, so, so you, you expect a reduction in the performance because of the RC core globally? I, I expect that maybe the, 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 the same damage on columns, which is expected in case of frame, frame for certain value of interstory drift and uh, total top displacement, are different, of course, in case of uh, the presence of uh, walls, uh, causing also this uh, irregularity uh, and torsional behavior. Okay. Thank you so I'm much. trying uh, to, to, to see uh, how far are uh, the predictions that typically are adopted uh, um, for frames, uh, because uh, risk QA and ASUS are typically for frames, uh, how far are in case uh, there is uh, a core or walls uh, causing eccentricity. That's okay, the thank you very much. Professor Asimina, would you like to make any comments? Okay, thank you. Congratulations for your presentation. I am not uh, sure. Have you presented the, the most shapes of the building? The most? The most shapes of the building. No, no, we didn't. No, no. no. I no, think no. that uh, the first or the second one is of uh, dominate the torsion in yes. the, so the building is uh, torsionally flexible yes. so what kind of uh, pushover analysis uh, have you performed then uh, extended and two or the classical pushover analysis as I, as, I, as I told during my presentation, at this stage, we, we applied a really simple uh, pushover analysis with the basic uh, distribution of forces, uh, uniform and triangular shapes. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we know that uh, we need to improve also this aspect, also because I know that colleagues uh, are working on this bidirectional effect and also modal shape. But we didn't at this stage. We are still uh, uh, we are still working on uh, um, reaching an appropriate level of modeling uh, to describe the problem. And later on, uh, we will move uh, to that. That, of course, is essential. Because according to Eurocode eight, the torsionally flexible buildings should analyze according to extended time to method. Yes. Okay, this is, and uh, one more question. Um, concerns um, uh, uh, how the beams uh, are modeled in uh, uh, with uh, the wall, uh, the, tor or the torsion in this um, in this case, where the beams joined with the wall, the torsion for beam is very small. How did you model this phenomenon? Um, we have beams which are connected to the node of the shell elements uh of the shell elements uh, uh so they are connected by sort of uh, rigid links uh, because uh, sometimes uh, the axis of the beam is not uh, reaching exactly the node of the wall so we are using a, a rigid connection so at uh, this moment at this moment uh, um, the uh, the torsion is uh, the torsion of the beam is considered is not neglected. 
Okay, thank you. Congratulations, Juan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to ask if there is any other questions and uh, to this presentation and also to the previous one that I did not allow for <laughs> time to, to make any questions to Thomas Arborski. Okay. So if there are any questions, then I would like to ask if they can be presented on the chat and uh, be replied later on. So um, maybe we can close this section for now. And um, we would like to suggest to start section number three after the lunch break, um, not at two o'clock as it was previously planned, but at two 15, just to give a little bit more time for lunch. <laughs> Okay, so okay. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Thank you.